Bob Katzman, Robert Katzman, do you have anyone helping you in your store? Do you no. have employees, interns, any of that? I work seven days a week. Uh, I run it without a computer. There's no barcodes. It's organized into 106 categories. I know where everything is, and people come in and say, how the hell can you run this place? And I tell them, how do you think people ran stores in 1940? If you don't know your stock, how can you be in business? Well, speaking of stock, uh, you know, one of the things that I've always been interested in uh, is, uh, well, it's a, a real important phase of my life, were uh, hot rod and custom cars. Do you yep. carry any of that stuff? I'm the last place in America that's got car magazines back to 1950. I've got uh, 10,000 car magazines. Well, I'm looking for a magazine called Rotting and Restyling. If you ever have that, I don't know if you know it off the top of your head, but no. it's a magazine I, I did take pictures for and write for back in the late 50s as a young kid. I'll give you a different answer that's not about what you're talking about. Even though I'm in Skokie, which people think is Jewish, but it's not. No, it's real, it's like, uh, it's, you know, United Nations over there in Skokie. It's, it's much more Eastern Asia, but I have the largest collection of civil rights and African American history in the country. And um, I don't know why I keep doing it, because I'm in the wrong place but I'm very interested in civil rights and unions. Well, I noticed that you had a copy of a Life magazine, and Life is something us older folks kind of grew up with. You know, we'd get it in the mail every week, and it was filled with pictures and captions, and it's a format that, that I really like. But you have one from 1937, I believe, of the Scottsboro case. That's right. Tell people what the Scottsboro case is. I'm that's not fair. Okay. Short term. Well, that's good. <laughs> but weren't, weren't they real? Uh, it they was a group of young uh, African Americans in the South who were uh, on trial. I believe it was for rape or murder. They were hung, weren't they? They were railroaded. They were, yeah. yeah. The boys on trial in Alabama, 1937. But it's not on the cover because I know what's inside the magazines. Yeah, it says. Well, you have a. For those of you who uh, are listening and not going to watch this on YouTube, it's uh, Life Magazine, July 19th, 1937. And he has a, uh, a label on it that says Scottsboro Boys on Trial in Alabama. Uh, what is your favorite magazine in, in your life? Either one particular issue or a particular brand? Well, I, I'll rephrase it. When I was 13, I found a drugstore that would sell me Playboy. And um, I Ooh. bought, well, that and came after Adam magazine. It, uh, a little bit, in, <laughs> in 1953. I took it back to uh, where I lived on the south side of Chicago, cut it up, and sold the pictures one by one to my classmates. So I was entrepreneurial even when I was 13. This was at the lab school. Well, that got me into the lab school <laughs> one way. And here it is. I'm 65. I'm still, no, I'm not. I'm 62. I'm still selling back issues of Playboy. But I'm the last place in the country that's got all 700. Have you, have you ever had uh, anyone come in who is uh, featured in a magazine uh, looking for their, their particular article or just decided to visit you and autograph one? I, well, I met Muhammad Ali and I met Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson wouldn't speak to me when he had Operation Push. He came in, looked around, and, and I went up to say hello and he wouldn't talk, which I never forgot. I remember how tall he was. He's a tall guy. He was a quarterback, I think, at Vanderbilt. But Muhammad Ali, when I was 16, I met him, and he's like this giant person. And I was, I'm not a sports fan, but what I remember is that when I was talking to him, he was completely focused on me. Yeah. And I understand why people love him. He makes you feel that you're important enough for his attention. No, he's something else. I actually met him on, a, on an airplane one time, and I was a little too shy to talk to him. All I said was, hey, I'm one day older than you, because his birthday is January 17th, 42, and I'm the day before. But he's uh, been one of my heroes, and certainly he was an American icon. And uh, for those of, you, of, of, of us on the left, he was a guy who really stood up to the forces that be around the Vietnam War. And uh, he's still a hero in my eyes. Dick Gregory and Jesse Owens were my customers when I was a teenager. And I want to mention something. In Hyde Park. Yes. Very tiny men. My grandfather was an immigrant carpenter from uh, white Russia and Poland. And my father told me in the 20s, when there were no carpenters' unions and they were forming, he would come back home bloody when they were trying to organize. And my, our whole attitude has been socialist and left wing and giving the ordinary man a chance and a voice. And that's what I write about, that we're important. 
Uh, tell us again how people can find you, both uh, the, the address yes, and the internet, and then I'm going to ask you to read a poem. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the chance to be here. The story is the Magazine Museum. It's 4906 Oakton Street, which is about a block west of the new train station, which nobody uses. I'm on the north side of the street. I'm next to Andy's Pancake House. Um, there every day, 10 to 5, and weekends, 10 to 2. What else am I supposed to tell you about that? Uh, that's enough. You okay. got to just give us the website. Oh, Magazine Memories. That's the old name. MagazineMemories.com. Uh, and if you go there, you'll see a documentary DePaul University made, 14-minute movie about one of the last back issue magazine stores in the United States. There's only four left. I hope people will come. Where are the other three? A couple of them are in Portland for some strange reason, but a reason to live in Portland. And another one in San Francisco. Really, we all know each other. We're friends. Good. And they're good people. People doing good work. Got to stick together. Okay, Robert Kassman, give us this poem. Tell us what it is and read it to us. He's getting his glasses ready. You are listening to Live from the Heartland Show on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. And uh, this is Robert Katzman of the Magazine Museum reading us his poem, Terminal Cafe, Coffin, Nails, and Java. Amarillo Diner, solitary truck stop. A ragged, rusty sign with every other leather black and broken and dead, like missing neon teeth. Lazy smoke drifting sideways out of a pipe, poking through an ancient corrugated tin roof. Trucks pointing east and west, both sides of the blacktop, coming from and going to 100 miles of nothing. Hairy black tarantulas crawling across the molten blacktop. Bleach cow skulls casually resting on the side of the road. Hot Sirocco wind blowing past a sagebrush canteen the men drift in, seeking shelter and coffee. Dottie and Carl, one cooks, one serves, a hyphenated couple in an endless sentence, serving sullen men as day drifts into night. Crack boots and big belt buckles, black leather wallets chained to thick leather belts, Marlboros and camels tucked into tight corners of parched lips, American truck drivers. Jeans sagging, they park themselves on spinning diner stools flashing the cracks in their ass for all to admire. Dottie brings coffee. Dottie brings eggs. Carl burns the toast, heaps on the hash browns. Not much conversation in the terminal cafe. Men, fleshy men, slap their long books on the counter, stare soullessly at the greasy griddle, sip their coffee, greedily inhale burning tobacco, gray ash falling on their bulging bellies. And so what? Big nations, small diner, regular crowd. When there's half a dozen gathered, old Dottie unbuttons a few buttons to thrill the guys, her sagging valley of death. Tits for tips, she smiles, flashing. The truckers cry in unison, oh, Dottie, no, button up. Damn roads, scary enough. Everyone laughs, even Carl. Not much else to break the silence or entertain this center of nothing. Smoky Shakespearean playhouse. Empty, play, empty plates, good tips, no one screws Dottie, or not like they used to when one look from her sly lizard eyes race their dieseling hearts. Time to shove off, they hit the can, one more steaming piss and out the door. One second. Dottie and Carl wave goodbye. Rust, rusty spring slams the diner store shut, making the damn horse flies fight their way in. Bellies full, motors grumble, gears grind, black exhaust spelt belching, tired eyes peering into oblivion, red tail lights shrinking smaller in the night. Someone's waiting, time is ticking, forever behind schedule, 18 wheeled ships passing in the desert. Yeah, brother, hell has messengers, breathing and blowing smoke, never enough time, never enough money. American truckers, too much freight on their shoulders, missing families on their minds, they hit their laughing devil's immortal road one more time. Thank you. Let's hear a big round of applause for Robert Katzman. I love that poem. Sounds, it looks like I've been in a place like that, a few of them. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. You are listening to the Live from the Heartland show on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. And uh, we are here every Saturday morning. We bring you this show. You can also see earlier editions if you go to youtube.com slash heartlandmedia. And, uh, in the recent month or so, we've had a, a fan named Lynn Orman who has uh, really helped us secure some wonderful music talent for, 
the shows. We've always had uh, a lot of musicians come on the show, but we've had it in a real regular way, and I want to thank Lynn, who is in the audience today. Let's have a big round of applause for Lynn Orman and all the good work she does for many, many things. And uh, I got a hold of her the other day to go over a few possible uh, appearances, and uh, she said, I have a great group that you should have on the show, and they just happen to be playing on the poetry stage at the Bucktown Festival today. We'll get more information on that. But it's Yuda and the High Dukes. So let's have a big round of applause for Yuda and the High Dukes, and I'm going to ask them to just kick it off with a tune, and then we'll talk a little bit, and then hear some more tunes. Are we almost ready? You got a, a lot of setup here. It looks good. We're okay. We got 30 seconds. So um, we encourage you all to uh, tune in and look at earlier editions of the show. We encourage you to be part of the live listening audience next week. Uh, we've got Marilyn Katz, uh, who uh, is of some renown and uh, had worked with the Obama campaign early on. We're going to talk about the elections. We're going to talk about the Republican Party. Uh, she'll fill us in. We're going to have uh, Dennis Cunningham, who is a famed uh, civil rights lawyer and good friend. He was my lawyer in the old days. And Dennis is uh, known for not only the Judy Barry case, but the Fred Hampton and the Attica cases. So they'll be on, and I think that we're going to have... Uh, well, there's just too many good people coming up to mention them all. So, oh yeah, we're going to have the Immokalee workers. There's a... Uh, okay, we ready to go? We ready to hear some music. Here we go. You and the High Dukes. Take it away. Oh, 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 oh,
Some of, let's talk for just a minute and get a little information about you guys. You know, uh, when I saw you come in here, Taryn Dorr, I, uh, I said, this guy looks familiar. And I said, did you guys used to be in the Balkan Rhythm Band? And you said, yeah. Well, I started. So, yeah. We, uh, I started back in 1980. And uh, the, um, the band evolved over time uh, into Utah and the High Dukes. Uh, Essentially, we went from playing jazz based on Bulgarian...